Hey, everybody. Welcome and happy Tuesday. I'm happy that you're uh, joining me again live for our continuing No Better, So Better series. Last month or earlier this month, they're all kind of running together. We covered um, a lot of beginner um, balancing, tension, threading machines, things of that nature. If you missed that, their replays and handouts are still available. Please leave a comment um, if you need this week's handout or any of the previous, and I'm happy to link to those for you. Um, and this series we're covering we're still covering basics um and even if you feel like you already do in between service maintenance on your machine i do encourage you to kind of check out the videos i have them split up into um drop in bobbin and vertical bobbin so it is a very long program today that i did pre-record the learning session so that you can refer to it when you need to but i do try to put a lot of information in there that's not covered in your basic um, videos that you might find on the internet. So, um, and I did kind of split up the information, some of the side notes I like to make about our procedures and things. Um, so what you're going to hear in um, one portion, there's going to be some other information spread out. So I do encourage you, even in, for the part that's not the type of machine you have, there's good info throughout the whole um the whole session today. So if you're joining me for the first time, welcome. My name is Andy Barney and I am a professional service technician. And I also teach all of my skills for troubleshooting, um, service repair, and uh, restoration online in our academy at Sewing Doc Academy. So we do have, try to do a free series every month. We do have three sessions coming up uh, to continue the Know Better, Sew Better series. And then we will launch our new modern machine maintenance program in early November. So November 8th will be our open house and we will open the doors to founding members, which means a discounted rate and a whole lot of extras that you won't get in the future. So you'll hear more about that as time goes on. Um, all of the information is on our website at sewingdocacademy.com. And I do encourage you, if you haven't already, to please like our Facebook page at Sewing Doc Academy and Machine Service and or our YouTube channel, which is Sewing Doc Academy. Um, this way you'll be notified every time we do a free live event, which is pretty frequently, um, and you'll be alerted to all of our upcoming programs. We are launching so many big things right now to try and shift the nature of our service industry to make you more independent to take care of your own machines rather than to always have to rely on a service technician. So I'm happy to answer questions about that. For today's session, if you do have questions, please drop them into the comments as we go along. And if I can't see your comment on my screen, it's very hit or miss sometimes. I will go back and answer your questions um, later and the replay will, of course, be available. So thank you for joining me and um, let's get started on our program. So what I chose to talk about um, and focus on this month is a lot of things you can do in between service appointments. And that's kind of a fun topic anyway. Um, I think in week three, I'm actually going to cover what happens when you take your machine in for service. Uh, we're at a weird crossroads where there's a lot of things coming into play about why people do or don't have their machine serviced. Um, what we're experiencing right now is one, there's a lot of younger folks that have come into the fold through making masks or just discovering the art of sewing that don't even realize that one, you should have your machine serviced um, once in a while. And two, that there's actually people that do that. So um, I just kind of feel like there's a disconnect um, sometimes when you get into sewing, you don't even realize that your machine is actually just a power tool that still needs some maintenance. So what I'm going through in this series, a lot of what you can do at home, and then we're going to talk about when you have to take it in, when it's like beyond your control, your options when it needs service, because that's what our modern maintenance program is. It's meant to replace you having to take it to the service shop. Um, but I think there's a lot of mystery involved. It, like, most people don't even know what happens when your machine goes in for service. So we're going to dispel some of the myths and tell you what happens, at least in our shop, um, when you take your machine in for service, what are they actually doing in there? Okay, so um, today's program is called Between Service Maintenance. And like I said, I have it split up into two different categories. One is the drop-in bobbin where... Um, when you're looking at the bed of the machine, the bobbin goes in. And then the second part of this is the vertical bobbin, which means it goes in through the front or the side. Um, and again, there's really good information um, on both sides. So even if you're 
it's a machine that you're not, don't currently have, I could encourage watching all the way through. And then on the back end of that is cleaning on the, the needle bar area, which if you're watching most machine, if you see any of these little tidbits on the internet, they usually don't talk about the things I do in this. Um, one of the big things is threads getting caught in the take up lever joints. And, um, so I am going to teach you to take that cover off if you need to. Some of them have a swing door. Um, and then there's a few machines you're not going to be able to get into. But I do, for those of you that can get access easily to that needle bar, do want to talk to you about pulling those threads out. Because all it takes is one thread getting caught in those mechanisms that pulls in another thread and another thread. And then you end up with a really rough situation with your machine. So again, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments and I will come back and answer them. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I do have some slides that I'm going to share. Give me just a second to um, get myself situated here. It's been a minute since I've done this. Let's do that. I like that better. All right. And I'm going to share my screen. All right. And all right. So like I said, we're working on between service maintenance today. So let's talk first about routine maintenance. And again, I'm going to cover the routine service part more in depth, probably on week three. So um, today, uh, this is just an overview of when you should reasonably have your machine serviced. If you have a computerized or electronic machine, so you see there on the left, we would consider that a full computerized um, sewing machine, usually your embroidery machines, your advanced machines, and some just regular sewing machines with fancy features. If it has a motherboard in it and any electronic components, it's going to need more service than your average mechanical machine. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Again, I'll go into detail later, but the lint that you pull out when you do between service maintenance is only a small portion of the lint that's actually gathering in your machine. And what happens is when you plug your machine in and you um, hit the foot pedal to sew, that little motor lights up and basically becomes a small vacuum and sucks the lint that's floating around your room into your machine. And it always settles, not always, it settles on the motherboard and the electronics, which then become insulation, heats up the machine. And this is where you're giving the dealer exactly what they want because as that board heats up over time with neglect from getting the lint off the board, um, it's going to wear down your computer a lot faster. So the people that have had computerized machines for 20, 25 years, um, a lot of that is probably attributed to keeping it maintained properly. Now, I'm not saying that if you don't maintain it, that it's going to die immediately. I'm just saying if you want to maximize the life you're going to get out of your machine, when it's computerized, you really got to have service. The machine on the right is technically, um, I would consider it an electronic machine. It has programmed in, um, stitch, so your stitch selector is run by a small board. It probably has needle up down. Um, some small features, but it's nowhere near as complex as that brother machine. But it still has electronics in it. And if you want those functions to keep working again. So here I have recommended um, if you this is for average sewing. This is not if you're a super heavy sewer. Like if you're sewing every single day for five or six hours, you're considered a heavy sewist. For people that are like weekend warriors or um, just kind of spread out your sewing, 12 to 18 months is is probably ideal. 12 if you're a heavy sewist or maybe even more frequently. 18 if you're pulling it out once a month, two times a month or whatever. Um, for the electronic machine on the right, 18 to 24 months. It does not have the same size of um, computer or motherboard in it. So it's not as delicate. So you could get away with about um, one and a half to two years. Now, for your mechanical machines, this down here in this picture is a really good example. It's a Viking Emerald, which um, I like a lot of machines, but as far as mechanicals and especially for the Viking brand, I love that machine. I would actually like to have one for myself. Nice, basic mechanical machine, no computer components in it. You 18 to 24 months is pretty sufficient. And then I added another category here called low-end machines. Um, and I understand the hesitance in people wanting to pay you know, 80 to a hundred dollars to have that little machine service when you probably paid a hundred to hundred and forty dollars for it. Um, so you can technically get away without servicing it, especially if you're on the light end of sewing about 24 to 36 months. Um, most 
honestly, most people that don't rely on that machine, like for business or constant sewing, um, they bring those machines in when there's something wrong. So we are actually working on a program specifically geared towards those low end machines so that you can still keep the life going rather than just having to replace it every time something goes wrong without it costing you so much. So we have a future program plan for that. But this is a really good guideline. And these notes are in your handout for today. So when should I do maintenance? And that by maintenance, I mean, this is what I'm teaching you today is between service maintenance. You should do this about every four weeks if you are a frequent sewist. So that means like if you're sewing several days a week, um, then we'll call you a frequent sewist. When you're working with high shed materials, this especially applies to things like fleece. Um, Christmas is coming. Everybody's going to start making pajama pants and robes and all those Christmas gifts with the fleece because it's warm, but it sheds a whole lot in your machine. Um, most of the machines that come in completely seized up usually are centered around fleece or some other high shed material. Minky, anything that puts out a whole bunch of um, lint that's gathering in your machine. Remember when you're going through this um, service maintenance, like between service maintenance that I'm teaching, that what you're seeing is only a small percentage of the lint that's actually gathering inside. Okay. So some people choose to do this little um, five minute maintenance every time you change the bobbin. That way you're remembering um, when you see lint and debris starting to gather is probably your number one sign, especially if you're one of those people using high shed materials, glitter, anything like that. When you start to see stuff gathering um, or, you know, like even on your needle bar, it's a sign. Go ahead and get everything cleaned out so that you're keeping your machine clear. Now, you don't need a lot of things for this. You probably already have what you need laying around with the exception of a few things. My most frequently recommended material is a pipe cleaner. Nothing fancy. Um, you can get these at Walmart, Amazon, everywhere you go for really cheap. They're disposable. You can use them until they die. You can put one in every single machine you have. You can, I mean, they're, they're really handy. And the reason I like the pipe cleaners is that they are chenille. So they're kind of going to have a bit of a static effect. When you put it in your machine, it's going to kind of draw the lint to it. So it's, you're going to be able to get that in tight places without the fear of losing it in the machine or dropping it or something falling off of it. So back um, a couple years ago when I was president of a guild, one of the things that they did for like a holiday craft was they made machine cleaners, which was kind of like a turkey. It was like a turkey basting, uh, whatever it is that you use to, to um, truss a turkey, like this little metal rod. And then they put some little decorative bead thing on the end to make it. It was a really cool idea, except that a couple of my customers ended up losing the beads and the decorative things into the machine. So I like to remove anything that's going to have anything falling off of it. So to me, the pipe cleaner is the absolute best choice of any of the items. Some people use a paintbrush. You just want to make sure that it doesn't have um, a shedding potential. So you, I mean, low end is okay. You just want to make sure that you're not going to lose bristles into the machine. And you can do a variety of sizes. Q-tips are an excellent source. Um, the hard part for those and the paintbrush too is with a Q-tip, you can only reach so far. You have a very short distance that you can get into the machine. And with the paintbrush, with it being a stiff end, trying to get into angles, you're really going to be able to do surface cleaning, but not get into the machine. Um, disposable mascara wands. I see a lot of people um, moving to this trend on Amazon. You can get packs of, you know, 10, 50, 100. Um, they are really nice because that wand is going to kind of be a stiffer version of the pipe cleaner. But again, usually they're really short. So getting into the machine is hard. Um, but I like it because you're not going to have to worry about anything falling off of it into your machine. And then we have, um, I don't really, this is a trend I feel like I see happening a lot. I'm not a huge fan. Those disposable dental things are not cheap. Um, so the little brush on it is kind of neat. Nothing's going to fall off. But again, you're so limited on how far you can reach in the machine that I just don't feel like the investment is really worth it. So you can use a combination of these things depending on what the situation is with your machine. But again, I'm going to, teach um, what I show in the videos. I will mention other things, but the pipe cleaner is what you're going to see because we all have access to pipe cleaners. The other thing I want to mention is that I do recommend the mini vacuum attachments, especially if you are working with those high shed materials. Um, 
we don't want to put things back into the machine. We want to take them out. So on Amazon, um, in some stores, you can find this super easy. It's called mini vacuum attachments. If you Google that or look on Amazon, you're going to find hundreds of them and they're all pretty much the same. So it's hard to tell on scale on the left, but you're going to get the hose and all these little attachments, including the two connectors that'll work with pretty much any sewing or sorry, vacuum cleaner. And then on the right here, you can see she's got the end of it with the little micro attachment in the machine so that she can suck out. Um, now what's funny is they're just demonstrating on that picture. I'm noticing where um, they haven't even taken the plate off, I don't think. So you will be able to get some things out of your machine better this way. I want to say the kits cost anywhere between $10 and $15. So very inexpensive. For our absolutely do not use please don't use canned air. Um, this is something I will preach about until I'm blue in the face. Um, rarely does any good come from canned air. So I know that when we see lint out of sight, out of mind, we feel like that's okay. But if you think back to what I said in the beginning, that lint becoming an insulator on your motherboards um, is a problem. What happens when you're using canned air is you're really just pushing everything further into the machine. So you're doing way more harm than good. I would rather your lint sit where it settles than you actually push it into the machine. So it presents a couple problems. One, almost every canned air product on the market is made from frozen air to in order to make it expel, which means you're actually putting moisture into your machine. Even on mechanical machines, that's not a good call. But on your computerized machines, that's especially dangerous. Um, number two, again, you're pushing everything into the machine. So you're creating a... Um, a blanket on your computer components if you have one. And then number three, even on your mechanical machines, what happens is um, your machine is lubricated in a very specific manner. And when you push that lint into the machine, it gathers where you have lubricant and then it absorbs the lubricant and then it starts to seize up your machine. So it may take some time, but I can assure you, if you don't have your machine regularly serviced and you're using canned air, eventually your machine is going to seize up to the point that you can't even turn the hand wheel. So I highly recommend avoiding canned air at all costs. I don't care the brand, I don't care what it is, avoid the canned air. All right. Um, as far as going on in tools, um, you're going to need a flathead screwdriver in most cases. Most of us have a, um, a needle plate cover that has one or two flathead screws on it. If you're using a Bernina or a Viking, and maybe if you sometimes they pop off or slide off, but you're probably going to need a screwdriver. So any normal flathead screwdriver that you can get in there is going to work. My highest recommendation are these little stubby screwdrivers. I know you can get them on Amazon in a four pack, which you see here, two flat heads in two different sizes and two Phillips in two different sizes. I find them to be invaluable to the point that I actually on Amazon have purchased a multi-set so that I could have um, five different stubbies. So one to keep all over the place. I have one actually right here on my workbench that I keep all the time. But I also put one of these in every single accessory tray of all the machines I sew on. So when you're doing this in between maintenance, um, this helps you get in between that spot. As you'll see in the video, you have very little clearance to get in those little screws. But I keep it in every single machine so that when I do this maintenance, it's right there. So I cannot recommend those enough. Tweezers are, uh, you may not use them all the time, but they are very handy to have around. Harbor Freight has a fantastic low-end um, tweezer set that I've been using for years. I probably have five or six of these sets myself. And it's actually the, I don't have one handy, do I? The needle nose um, tweezers are my favorite. Here we go. Like I said, I've got five or six of these in my own, one in my bag. I've got one in my, both of my workshops. So these alone, I think you're going to pay $3 for that entire pack. But the, the bit nose are my favorite because um, they actually grip really well instead of having that gap. And I'm able to get um, lint, big pieces of lint, thread and things out of my machine. So I'm going to link to these, um, all of these products in your handout. But the Harbor Freight set is to me an value. And while you're at Harbor Freight, which if you're in any of my programs, you know, I talk about um, Harbor Freight a lot. Um, 
very inexpensive tools and they don't need to be heavy duty for what we do. The picks are also an excellent investment. So you're going to get um, about six picks in a set, I believe, um, in different sizes and different types. And I use those a lot for digging out um, threads in your bobbin case or um, if you get them caught in the take up lever joints. So those are my, my most recommended tools and the links will be in the handout. As far as sewing machine oil, you're seeing an array of options here. Um, I, from left to right are kind of my, uh, they're not really in order of recommendations, but these are your options. So on the left is the Zoom Spout, which is the Lily White Zoom Spout. I am a huge fan of that. It is um, pure sewing machine oil. It's clear. Anything you put in your machine, you want to be clear, except for that blue creeper you see on the right there. Um, if it's got a yellowy tint to it that you can tell, it, that means the impurities are starting to go bad and, and rancid. So I like that Zoom Spout is in a clear bottle so you can see it. And it has this long extending neck so you can put one drop of oil exactly where you need it. The next one is called Lily White, and that's a large bottle. I don't think that most of you need that large of a bottle, but it is another brand, um, which is just London Electric uh, Quilters. Um, but the Lily White comes across many different brands. So that's why I wanted to point that out. Singer does sell their own sewing machine oil, which you can get at Joann's and Walmart and probably other stores. I'm personally not a fan of the bottle. One, unless you have another bottle to put it into to help you get to the spot you need to put the drop of oil. My other issue is that it's not a clear bottle, so you can't see the oil. And every bottle of Singer oil I've ever had or customers had has been yellow once I've already put it into another bottle to see through it. So the um, fourth option that you see there is an oiling pin. Now you can order those with um, different oil in them. But so just make sure that when you order that you're specifically ordering one for sewing machine oil. Um, but I like that because it's going to, when you squeeze it, it's going to literally place one drop exactly where you need it. And it has a nice long needle uh, nose on it. That little pin is going to probably last you a lifetime doing just this between service maintenance. So you don't need a lot. And then the fifth option at the end there is um, Blue Creepers sewing machine oil um, version. It's not necessary. If you are in any of my programs or you plan on going into um, sewing machine service as a career, I do recommend it as a product. Their bottle is awesome. It doesn't even show the full scale of how long the tip of it goes, but it's very flexible and that bottle locks. So that's not a necessary item. It's just another suggestion. So these are the things that you can use to put that drop of oil or two drops of oil in your machine that I'm going to teach you. Now, I have a long list of do not recommends. And this is where sometimes the internet is very, very frustrating because when a customer brings in their machine that they've cared for based on some random information or videos on the internet, this is where things go wrong, okay? So number one, no mineral oil. Mineral oil has lots of uses. And in fact, I do teach you in one of my videos how to lubricate your thread with mineral oil. But mineral oil, oil is a highly degraded version of sewing machine oil. So it's got a lot of impurities in it and it will get tacky over time and gum up your machine. So no mineral oil, no three in one oil. Um, this has probably been one of the largest battles we've had as professional technicians. Three in one oil does have something in it that over time gets really sticky. And I would say a fair number of machines I've dealt with that are completely seized have been because of three in one oil. So no three in one oil. No WD-40. I don't care how old school your um, lubricating methods are. I know WD-40 is great for door hinges and all kinds of things. Please don't ever put WD-40 in your machine. Um, there's no need for it. Even when something is stuck, WD-40 is going to do more harm than good. It's technically a water displacement, which means it's seeking to dry up any moisture that's causing the rust or the, the issues. What's in your machine is probably not a rust issue. So no WD-40. Um, no gun oil. I don't think that it's going to do as much harm as the other three, but there is no sense in using gun oil when we have perfectly good sewing machine oil available and no bike lubricant. No, um, I don't know anything else. We get this a lot, mostly from, um, husbands that are trying to be helpful that have various lubricants laying around really, really, really stick to sewing machine oil. It's affordable. It's accessible. It's easy to get. Just stick with the thing that works. Okay. 
So I have some important rem uh, reminders that I'm constantly report um, repeating throughout this and any program you're ever in for me. So one is that the maintenance I'm teaching you in this does not replace routine service. I cannot tell you how many times, and I will show you pictures of this in our open house on November 8th, um, how many times customers were like, I don't need routine service. I do it myself. And do it yourself means what I'm teaching you here. That's not a replacement for routine service. So again, when we're doing the, this between service maintenance I'm teaching you, we're just taking off the lint that's accessible. We're not getting the stuff that's inside the machine. So this does not replace routine service. I highly recommend reading your manual for oil instructions. You're going to see a lot of them say they don't need to be oiled at all. Then you're going to have some like a Juki TL98 or 2010 that have oiling points on them. So it really depends on the manufacturer and how they make the machine, depending on where it needs to be oiled. So always refer to your manual and do as it says, okay? I'm gonna give you some general guidelines that are gonna not ruin any machine, but do read your manual for that. Do not try to remove the covers without proper instruction. This is a huge temptation and you may get lucky and do it successfully, but for one, you can really do damage to the outer shell of your machine when you're taking off the covers without instruction. They are not easy to remove in most cases. Some of them are, the majority aren't. Um, we are releasing our program next month that does teach you to remove the covers properly to also avoid ruining any computer components, any wiring. That's a very expensive repair. So, please, and though, while I'm teaching, teaching you on some parts to do some things. Um, I highly recommend don't doing that, not doing this without um, proper instruction. We already talked about canned air. Do not use canned air in your machine and use only sewing machine oil. Um, and then one drop of oil. And we're going to cover that. But these are the things I want you to keep in mind as we're going through this material. Oh, and don't over tighten screws. Um, I, you will hear me use the term hand tight quite a bit, which means um, when you start to feel the screw give resistance, stop. Because you should be able to get that screw off easily next time. But you want it tight enough that enough wraps, okay? So we're going to start with drop-in bobbins. Um, again, this is a picture of a drop-in style bobbin where it's on the top of the machine right at the needle plate. And then we're going to move into vertical bobbins that go in into the front and vertical bobbins that go in on the side. So kind of those are your Juki, um, TL98, 2010s, the Brother, 1500, the Husqvarna Viking Mega Quilter, I think. So there's a variety of machines. Now, again, if you have questions, leave them in the comments. I'll go through and answer them for you probably after the session. And then be sure to ask for the handout. So if you would like the link to the handout, leave that in the comments, and I'm going to make sure that you get the link to it. Next week, we're going to cover the tension disc and check spring inspection and cleaning. That's where we're going to take off the cover for the needle bar and do some work in there. Then in two weeks, we're going to go through what an actual sewing machine service is and all the subtle signs that your machine is crying for help that you might be missing. So we have a full program for you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, get our live um I'm going to go ahead and get the uh, pre-recorded material for you. Again, if you have any questions, leave them and I will be back to answer them. Thank you. So we're going to start with a top loading machine, which you can see here just means that the bobbin sits on the top of the machine, not in front or not on the side. It's probably the most common style of machine. So um, let's get started on this. So we're gonna start by taking out the needle. The last thing we wanna do is stab ourselves while we're maintaining our machine. So take out your needle, and unless you know that this is still a really good needle, um, as in you haven't used it more than 10 to 12 hours, um, hasn't been skipping stitches, I'd say throw it out and replace it. If you know it's new, then hang on to it, but be aware of how old your needle is. But um, in this instance, you should only be using your needle about 10 to 12 hours unless you're using a platinum or titanium or gold needle. So I'm gonna put that to the side. I'm gonna also take off the foot to make it easier to get to our bobbin. So I'm gonna loosen this here. I like to loosen mine and then use my hand. The handy quilter is a lot like the Janome in that you do have to remove the screw completely to get the foot off. So I'm gonna put both to the side. Next, we're gonna take off, this is your bobbin plate or your needle plate. 
Um, the bobbin cover comes off first, if you have one, and then we're going to, uh, this one only has one screw, but most machines have two screws. Bernina's have, um, some have a lever, some of them have a way that you pop it off, some of them you have to pry off. So if you don't know how to get your, um, your needle plate off, please check your manual if you don't have a manual or you can't find out how. Comment uh, down the bottom and we'll help you get your needle plate off. Uh, I wish I had it with me and I don't, but they actually make a little screwdriver called a stubby and it's about this big and it's really convenient to get down in here. It fits in this little space easily so that you can remove these screws. I actually keep one in the compartment of all my machines so that when I do this maintenance, it's really easy to get in there. But for now, I'm going to have to use a regular screwdriver, which I don't love, and I'm just going to work on loosening that screw. And I'm going to loosen it to the point where I can finish taking it off with my finger. It's just easier in that small space. So we're going to remove that and put your screw to the side. Lift off the needle plate. And put that to the side. Take your bobbin out. And then that leaves us with our bobbin case. And if you've never really looked in here before, I do want to point out a few things. So what you see here, this black piece is actually the bobbin case. Then there's also a bobbin stop spring, which is what this little piece is. You'll see a little thin aluminum spring right here. And if you wiggle your bobbin case, it has a little bit of movement and that bumps up against that little spring there. There's also another one over here. These measurements in between these two are very precise. So please don't ever loosen or remove either of these screws. Do not make any adjustments to these. When the thread comes around, it has to clear this spot precisely and this spot. So if you mess with this and adjust anything, it will definitely change the way that your thread acts and you'll probably have skip stitches. So the point is you should be able to easily take the bobbin case and lift it out. You may have to wiggle it, but it should lift right out around both of those. Okay, and what you have underneath now is this is your actual hook, this thing that rotates. If you turn the hand wheel, you'll see the hook moving. So when it rotates, this right here is your hook. Um, it is very sharp. You, If you um, hit your finger with it enough, it will make you bleed. I have been injured many times by hooks. So this is sharp. What it does is whenever the needle comes down, this passes through and picks up the thread at the needle and that's what causes the lock stitch. So first you wanna feel along there, make sure there's no jagged edges. If you feel a roughness or um, you know, like a, a burr, then you need to take your machine in for service because that's gonna to have to be fixed. I do not recommend filing that down yourself. The shape of this hook and its position and relationship to the needle are extremely precise. So if you file this down, you're gonna change all those settings and could potentially ruin the machine. In some severe cases, this actually needs to be replaced. So if you feel anything sharp in there and you've been experiencing skip stitches or something kind of inconsistency, it's a good time to have that checked. All right, so let's get to the cleaning part. I'm gonna recommend, um, my most favorite tool is a um, basic pipe cleaner that we're gonna fold in half. And you're gonna create this nice little loop up here at the top. The reason I like this is two, two main reasons. One is that this creates a nice little loop up here and you have a nice length of this so that you can't lose this in the machine. The goal is to not leave anything in this machine, okay? The other reason is because it's fluffy and it will grab lint like nothing else. So before we continue, one of the biggest or most frequent questions I get is about canned air. No, no, no to canned air. Please do not ever put canned air into your machine. One, it has moisture in it and you're pushing that into your machine, which you don't want. And two, all it's doing is taking the lint and pushing it into your machine. So in this case, this is a computerized machine. You've paid good money for your computerized machine, and when you use that canned air, the lint is going to fly into the machine and land on your computer boards, which is kind of a magnet to the lint. And then the lint acts as an insulation, so when it heats up, it will actually burn out your computer. This is not what we want. Even for a non-computerized machine, if you blow lint into the machine, it's gonna collect in the places where your lubricant is, dry up the lubricant, and then compact and seize up your machine. So no canned air. Okay, we want to take things out of the machine, not put them back in. 
So using the pipe cleaner, we're going to start here in the hook area, which is typically the worst. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've opened up the machine to find a shelf of lint in here to the point that sometimes it's actually pushing the bobbin case out of the machine. So this is a brand new machine. So unfortunately it's going to be the most boring clean out ever, but let's pretend this is full of lint. You're going to get everything out that you can. You may need to use tweezers to pull out big chunks of lint um, if you need to, but get out what you can. Then we're going to actually work and use the pipe cleaner to get down into all these parts. You can shove this thing down in here. You're not going to break anything. You're not going to pull anything out of there that you should. You look how deep I can get into this machine, okay? And I love that I'm not probably not going to lose it. So you're going to pull it back out. And again, if you want to get down here into the main lower shaft, you can get down in this part. Look how, how far into this machine you can go. So... I love the pipe cleaner. So you're just going to move things around in different angles and get stuff out of there on all sides. Okay. One other thing to check. Here's your feed dogs here. There are two recesses on this particular set of feed dogs. Yours may look different, but lint tends to build up here and compact. So you're going to use your tweezers or a toothpick or something to get any chunks of lint out of this area. One area that uh, over here that's while we're cleaning that's neglected is the, um, this is your needle bar and this is your presser foot bar. Lots of lint gets built up in here, probably won't affect the sewing in general, but get all that off there because that just falls down in here and makes it worse. Um, so check and make sure you don't have a bunch of lint hanging around up here. So the other thing we're going to look at is your bobbin case. Um, almost all bobbin cases in top loading machines look the same. It's probably going to be black. Um, you're going to have a sharper point on this side and a duller point on this side, but very similar. Okay. So you're going to want to feel around and look for any burrs or any, um, jagged edges along here. Sometimes if the needle comes down and hits this, it's going to cause a burr. If that's the case, you're probably going to have to replace it. These do get replaced fairly frequently because the springs do wear out. So if a technician tells you need to have it replaced, do not be alarmed. That's not a um, scam to get you to buy parts. It's really just a fact of sewing life. What we want to do with this bobbin case is check out um, the springs. And this is your spring, this tension spring here. And this is where your thread, when you load it in your thread, you run it through this guide and it comes out over here. It increases or decreases the amount of tension on your thread. Um, first and foremost, do not please with these screws. Do not try to take these parts out. Do not undo this screw. This is your tension adjustment screw. Um, I would not recommend messing with either of these screws. There are other videos of, from Sewing Doc that tell you how to um, adjust your tension. If you know how to do that or follow the video, I, that's fine, but do not take this apart, okay? But what you wanna do is look in all of these grooves through here, look for any caught threads in there, and um, maybe use a pick or a toothpick or something to pull anything out that you see. The tiniest amount of thread or lint caught in there will cause tension issues, um, skip stitches, all kinds of stuff that will drive you crazy. Okay, and then once that's finished, it's going to be time to get everything back in here. So most top loading machines, not all, but most of them have a wick right here in the center. You have this the white ring, the black ring, a silver ring, and then if you have what looks like a piece of lint or sponge or something in there, that is your wick. Okay. Do not pull that wick out. Um, it, what it does is you put a drop of oil in there and it draws it down into the moving parts as needed, which is very intelligent. So what we're gonna do, if you have that, if you have that, we're gonna put one drop of oil. This is pure sewing machine oil. Um, no WD-40, no Triflow, no uh, gun oil, nothing you read on the internet other than sewing machine oil. But you're going to take and put one drop of oil. And when I say one drop, I mean literally one drop. You do not want to squirt anything anywhere in your machine. And you're going to leave that be. The other place we're going to oil, and you should do this um, as frequently as you maintain your machine. Okay, this little ledge of your bob, this is the bottom of the bobbin case. There's a ledge here that rides along this metal. And what we're going to do is put one drop of oil right there on the ledge. Again, one drop, not two, three, four, five, six. And we're going to place this back in. You're going to probably have to wiggle this in there, but you're going to get it to where this nodule lines up on the side of that bob and stop spring. Okay. So once it's in there, you should be able to do that wiggle thing again. And when you turn your hand wheel, that's going to distribute that one drop of oil all the way around. And then this way you'll know that your bobbin case is set in there properly. 
Okay, so that's the maintenance part. So one other place that we're going to check, um, just to be sure, this is your take-up lever. When you turn your hand wheel, it's the part that goes up and down and guides the thread. Um, there's usually a place where you feed your thread through. Just make sure there's no threads caught in there hanging out, because that will affect your tension for sure. And then once we're finished with that, we are going to put um, pick your bobbin plate and look at the back side and make sure there's no lint or dirt buildup. If there is, give it a nice little wipe down, make sure it's clean. And then we're going to put this back on the machine. And we're going to put the screw back in if you have one. So just like I did taking it off, I'm going to take my hand and I'm going to tighten it. And I'll be honest with you, I rarely use a screwdriver to put it back on. Once I can't put that in there anymore, I'm going to take my fingernail and move it until I can't move it with my fingernail anymore. That's because it should be hand tight, not so tight that you can't get it undone. And that's a safe way to know, look, it's not moving. I can't wiggle it, but it's going to be very easy to get off the next time. Okay. And then I'm going to put my new needle back on and my presser foot. So let's get our presser foot here and get this on. This should also be hand tight, which means tight enough that it's not going to come off of there, but not so tight that you can't get it off the next time. And this is especially important for the needle. This, um, this needle clamp here and this screw, you should only tighten it enough that it's, the needle's going to stay in there, but you do not want to torque this, especially if you have a Husqvarna Viking. I've probably said this already before, but this can be an expensive fix for such a cheap part. So only hand tight. And then we're going to put our bobbin back in and our needle plate cover. And now maintenance is done on your top loading machine. So you see we have a Janome here. Um, it's a compact model, but this is kind of your basic com uh, non-computerized machine. So we're going to show you the proper way to care for your machine between services. Um, as I said previously, this does not replace regular routine service. This is just basically what to get you through until it's time for your service. Um, and this is for a front or side loading machine. Um, if you take off the arm here, you'll see that the little door opens up and this is a uh, front loading bobbin. So the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and take out your bobbin case. This is your bobbin case. And I'm just going to set this right here for now. And this right here, now this is where people usually get confused. We are going to take out, this here is called the hook retainer. And you see here we have these little black things here. Uh, most front loading, machine, front loading machines have a similar setup. So you're going to take one of these and flip it to the side and flip the other one to the side. And then that's going to allow you to take out the hook retainer. And the hook is probably going to fall out as well. So we're going to put these aside for a minute. And we're also going to go ahead and take the needle out. The last thing we need is to accidentally stab ourselves with um, a needle. And then we're going to go ahead and take the presser foot off as well. So we have a little more room to work. And you don't have to take the screw off completely. If you can get this off without it, that'd be great. If not, that's okay too. So I'm going to put this to the side. And then you're going to have either one or two screws on your needle plate, depending on what type of machine you have. And you'll need a screwdriver. So whatever you can use to get in there, it's a very tight spot. What I like to do is loosen them enough that I can finish off with just loosening it with my hands. Now this is a brand new machine. So First of all, everything's going to be clean in it and everything's going to be harder to remove. So, And once I have all of that off, you can lift your needle plate off. This gives you access to your feed dogs, um, all this area in here. Um, this is your this is where your bobbin sits and if you take a look you know you, this is what holds your hook this piece here 
this piece here in my hand is actually the hook. This really sharp tip right here, and please be careful because it is very sharp, is really important. This is the part that picks up the thread. As the needle goes down, this comes around and picks up the thread and that's what locks the stitch. So we're gonna talk about that in just a minute. Now again, like I said, this is a brand new machine so it's not very dirty. Yours hopefully um, shows some signs of use, but so I got you a little bit better of a view there. And the whole goal is you're gonna usually see a lot of lint and buildup in here where you might see very little. It really depends on so many things like what type of thread you use, what type of fabric you're sewing with, um, if there's batting involved, if you're sewing fleece, I can guarantee you, you need to do this cleanup procedure much more often. Um, if you're doing good quilt shop quality cotton, maybe not as much, but we need to get lint out of there. So we have a few different options. My most favorite option is just a pipe cleaner that I can fold in half. And what I want to do is make a little loop. And that's because you can, it's going to attract a lint, but you can get down in every part of this. What I really like is you can get back here. Now back behind that is your gears and you're just going to kind of floss anywhere that you can reach. Well, the reason I like this is because it's, it does collect lint better, but you're not going to lose anything in your machine. You're not going to break anything. You can't bump anything. You can't, nothing will fall off. You can't really drop it in there. You have to try really hard. I mean, you can shove this down in there and leave it, but you can see, you can get really deep in there and, and clean things out. Unfortunately, it's a new machine, so you're not going to see anything, but I can guarantee you if you're doing this on your home machine and you've been sewing up a storm, then you're going to be able to get some stuff out of there. So you're going to want to get in every part that you can and get as much out of there as possible. Um, if, if a pipe cleaner is not an option, um, Q-tips also work. So this is just a standard Q-tip. Uh, I prefer Q-tips from Dollar Tree that have the wooden handle or um, now Big Lots also carries my favorite. But you're just going to do the same thing and you can see it's going to pull off that. You want to try not to lose any lint in there or any cotton. But you can also get back here and still clean just not as far as with the pipe cleaner. The third option is to use a small paintbrush, but you just want to use one that um, that doesn't shed. So be careful of that. Uh, the other good thing to have on hand is a pair of tweezers. You're going to look in these parts and make sure you don't see any threads caught, um, especially where these little springs are right here. You want to make sure there's nothing caught in those. And I also keep on hand a pick, um, which is probably going to come in more um, uh, useful for a drop-in or top-loading bobbin. So um, we'll show that on another one. But again, if you have little threads caught in there, you can safely dig things out without having to do any damage. So we've already cleaned this whole area out here. Um, I do want to give another caution. I get asked this all the time. People ask about canned air. Um, I caution and highly caution against using canned air. Anytime that you use canned air, you're going to blow this out and yes, some of it's going to come out towards you, but more often than not, you're going to shove more lint back up into your machine. This really matters because all of these moving parts, you can see there's just a few here, but your entire machine is made up of moving parts. That lint is going to collect on the lubricant, and then if that absorbs all the lubricant and you're running your machine, you have the potential of completely seizing up your machine. So you don't want to put lint further into your machine. You want to take lint out of your machine. So if if the you have more lint than can handle a pipe cleaner, the next best option is to get a vacuum cleaner attachment set. They're about $10 on Amazon. It's called a mini vacuum attachment. It attaches to your regular vacuum cleaner and you can go ahead and suck all the lint out of there if you want. You want to take lint out, not put it back in. So that is my warning. I will never ever advocate for putting canned air in your machine. Okay, so now this whole area is cleaned out. Okay, now while we're at it, I also want to clean out any lint we can find up here. Believe it or not, there's a lot of lint that will collect. So you're gonna turn your hand wheel and we're gonna make sure this is all cleaned out up here. Um, 
get any lint out of there. You can do the same thing here. You can put this up here and kind of clean out as far as you can go, but you just want to kind of get anything out of there that you can. So um, that brings us to all the other things. This, again, this is your hook. And what you want to check for on the hook right here on the tip, there should be a very, very sharp tip. Let me see how close I can get where you can see it's a very sharp tip. I've actually injured myself more than once with these um, where I've actually hit my finger with it and it's, it's, it's a puncture wound. So please be very careful, but you want to run your finger along it and you will be able to feel if there is a rough spot or a burr. And if there is, uh, I highly recommend that you get it in for service. Those burrs will cause thread breakages, um, thread tension issues. It'll cause your stitches to skip. It causes thread nests, all kinds of issues. Um, I do not recommend filing this down yourself. The thing is, if you look at this tip of this, it's designed in a very specific manner. If you find a burr on there and you just start filing away at it and you change the shape, even a hair, um, your needle is lined up specifically within fractions of a millimeter for this to hit, pick up the thread. If you start filing away at this to get rid of the burr, then your timing is going to be off and you're really going to not have um, a, a good sewing experience. So if this has actually damaged the hook, and that happens usually if the needle comes down in the wrong space for some reason and actually breaks off the tip of the hook and some burrs, it actually requires you to have this replaced. Um, that's not expensive on all machines. On some machines it will be. On these machines that are front and side loading, slightly less expensive, but on the top loading, it's a lot of labor to get that changed. So I do not recommend that you try to file and fix this yourself unless you have specific training and knowledge. So after you checked that, you'll see back here, there is a little ridge that runs along this, um, this piece. And that is what rides on this metal here. So basically you constantly have metal riding on metal. Um, in your manual, it probably says if you have a modern machine, I can almost guarantee you it tells you it's a self-oiling machine, which means you don't need to oil anything. And it's true. You personally do not need to oil anything other than this hook. Now, some of you that own Jukies, modern Jukies, the 2010s, the TL98s, you do have some oiling points in there. So I encourage every single person to find your manual, read it, and find out what it recommends for oiling. The majority are going to tell you not to oil. So... This is true for every single machine though. You want to oil this hook. So what I have here is pure sewing machine oil. If you look, you can barely see it. It's clear. It, um, the only thing that you ever want to put in your sewing machine is sewing machine oil. I don't care what you read on Facebook or in groups or um, an, the old man that lives down the street that tinkers with, with mechanical things. This is the only thing you want to put in your machine. No WD-40, no 3-in-1 oil, no white grease lightning, whatever that is, the white, the white lightning grease. Nothing other than pure sewing machine oil. No mineral oil. That's because that means there's no impurities in there. Now if you buy a bottle of oil and it's turning yellow, time to throw it out because that means the impure, it's gotten sticky. But this has no impurities in it. Um, this in, is a telescoping one, so I'm going to pull this out and take off the lid, the cap, and all we're going to do, it's very important that you hear me here, one drop of oil right here on this ridge, one drop, and this particular bottle is made to squeeze hard. So you see that drop of oil I put on there? That's going to self-distribute. Once I put this back in the machine, it's going to run along the metal and distribute. Please do not ever squirt oil anywhere into your machine. This one drop is something you should do I don't know, maybe every project, every time you change a bobbin. Um, it can be frequent, but one, one, one drop. So once we've made sure that's cleaned out and has our drop of oil, we're going to get this back in. There's only one way this can go in, and once you can see, it actually completes the full circle. So once that's sitting in there, you're going to take your retainer, this is called your retainer, and typically dust likes to build up right here on the top, so make sure this is clean. And also back here in these little ridges, this is where stuff likes to build up. So again, this is a new machine. You won't see anything here, but check in here for any threads that are caught or build up. And sometimes you'll have to take a 
Q-tip. You can wet it with a little, like a drop of sewing machine oil and you can get in there and get all that out of there. Make sure this is clean. And then this is gonna go back on. You'll notice there's a little notch right here and a notch right here. So you're just gonna put this back in over your hook. And then you're gonna close this side and this side. Okay, and then turn your hand wheel and you are back to good. I do encourage turning your hand wheel a few times, that's distributing the oil. Um, people ask all the time, is that gonna cause there to be oil when I sew? After you do a clean out like this, you're always going to want to do a test sew just to make sure everything's set right, that your tension is good, and you may see a drop of, a little trail of oil on your first sewing lines, but after that you should see nothing. The last thing we need to cover for this particular machine is the bobbin case. So this is our bobbin case, and again, this one's brand new, so it hasn't been used, um, but you may see down in here um, along the edges here, you might start to see lint. So the best thing to do typically is to take a Q-tip and run it around in here and get anything out that you can. You do not ever want to put any oil or anything like that in this bobbin case. So you don't oil it, you don't really clean it any other way. And just check and make sure that you don't see any, um, and feel it around. You want to make sure you don't feel any sharp edges, no burrs, nothing that's going to snag the thread. And I don't feel anything here. The last thing I want to check is, this is the tension spring. So, you know, you draw your thread through here and draw it over to the side where it comes out. You want to check this whole area and make sure you don't see any threads caught in there at all. If you have a little teeny tiny bit of thread caught here, it's not going to allow the tension to be consistent. So check really good. So now what we're going to do is we're going to put our needle plate back on, which um, if you, most of them have markings on them. If you can read them the right side up, then that means that you probably have it on there right. There's only one way this can go on. Make sure your feed dogs are through. And then you're going to take your screws and put them back into place. And again, I like to hand tighten as much as I can. This is a standing rule on any screw in this sewing machine with rare exception. You never want to tighten screws more than hand tight. Hand tight means you've tightened it enough that it's not gonna just jiggle loose, but it's not so tight that you can't get it undone the next time. So you really should not have to pry to get these screws loose the next time you do your cleaning regimen. So I'm just going to, all right, so now I get some resistance and I am barely going to tighten that. Okay, that's back on. And then I'm gonna put my foot back on here. Same thing with this screw, hand tight only, which means you're going to get this on there to where it's not going to come loose, but we are not going to really wrench this and make it too tight. So that's on. And the last thing I'm going to do is grab a brand new sewing machine needle and um, please check your manual if you don't know which way. It is very important. There is another video coming about um, sewing machine needles. On most modern machines, you're going to do flat side the front. In fact, if you have a front loading machine, you're always going to put your needle front side, flat side to the front, to the back. So we'll put that in there. And then same thing with this screw right here. You should really not need a screwdriver to loosen this. So I tightened this and it's hand tight. If I need to loosen it, I can do it with my hand. So you want to tighten, especially, let me make a note. If you have a Husqvarna Viking of any brand of any model or no matter what era they are known to have issues with their um, needle clamp you do not want to crank this screw because that will be a very expensive fix and a headache so trust me on this one and then the, your machine is ready to go again so you can load up your bobbin and get your bobbin in there get your bobbin case inserted back in the machine and you are ready to roll it's one last little bit of maintenance. It's easy to clean out. Um, take a, a, a soft cloth and clean out here and you can wipe down your machine. And, um, and I, would, I would do a once over on your machine once in a while. 
Finally, we have the side loading machine, which uh, a lot of the side loading machines have a similar setup as what I showed you in the front loading machine, and that is um, that they have the little levers that release the retainer. Now, this is a Brother uh, 15S, 1500S, which is very similar to a Juki 2010. TL98, any of them that are straight stitch only, they all kind of look similar over here, but your bobbin is over here on the side. So this is specifically for those that do not have the retainer that comes loose. What we're gonna do for this machine is not much different than we would do for the others. Gonna go ahead and remove the screw, I mean the um, needle. Gonna loosen that. Again, unless you know, if you know that this is a new needle, that's fine. Go ahead and keep it. If it's an old needle, more than 12 hours of use, or um, has been through some rough and tough things, go ahead and dispose of it. We're going to take the presser foot off. And I usually leave the screw on here. We're going to take the needle plate off. So you have this little lever here, and this flips down, and we're going to take this needle plate off. So I'm gonna go ahead and get these loosened. And just so I can, you gotta work around all these things here. Be careful of your tension assembly on the front, but I like to get them loosened and then take these out with my fingers. And this plate's gonna lift right off. Now, this is probably a better example than I've had before. We're gonna start up here on the top. This is your feed dogs. As I mentioned in previous videos, you're gonna get compacted lint in this area so if you see any compact lint get that out of there with some tweezers we're going to take the bobbin case out so we're not so much worried about the lint that's down here sitting on the plastic what we are worried about is lint that's caught in the um here where in the hook where your bobbin case sits you can see it's pulling out lint um, things really like to stick to the pipe cleaners but you can get this way back in there Again, since this doesn't replace service, you're going to pull stuff out of here, but just be clean, because you, look at this, see how that is? Just because you get this lint out of here doesn't mean that you can avoid doing professional service. This is only a small fraction of the lint that's in your machine. This, what this is doing is getting out what we can, but it keeps lint from building up here in the hook area and snagging your thread while you're sewing. So if you get lint build up in here, it will create drag on your thread and you'll have tension issues. So you can see I'm getting a lot out of here. Um, you can go ahead and clean up the lint here, but we really want to focus on any lint that's around the hook and the feed dogs. And I can, and you're not going to break anything. So don't worry about getting this pipe cleaner deep down into the machine. Look at all this lint it's bringing out. Um, you want to just get in there and pull out everything you can. So don't worry, you're not gonna break anything and you're not gonna pull out any parts that you shouldn't. But we wanna get all that out of there. See look how far back I can go here without losing my pipe cleaner. <laughs> and there's a lot of fuzz coming out of here. This machine definitely needs a service. If you see just this much lint coming out, you're well overdue. Um, for service. This is kind of ridiculous. <laughs> and this is actually one of my machines. It was donated to me years ago and it's one that's needed a lot of repair. So we're working on getting it uh, fixed up and sent out to someone who needs it. So I specifically want to talk about this down here. So unlike the um, front loading machine, there is no way to remove the, the retainer here. So if I turn the hand wheel, if I can, you'll see the hook move. Okay, and we want to look for any caught threads. You always want to take a pick. These dental picks work really well. You want to look for anything caught in along these parts here. You don't want to really pick at things, but you want to look and see, make sure there's nothing. There's a piece of lint. You want to make sure there's no threads hanging out of these parts. And keep turning the hand wheel and checking it out. And we're going to, once it's nice and clean and we've checked all that, we're going to put one drop of oil clear sewing machine oil, um, no WD-40, no Tri-Flow, no gun oil, nothing that you see suggested on the internet, just pure sewing machine oil. And you're going to look at where these two parts move. So you'll see when I turn the hand wheel, this metal part right here moves against that metal part. So we're going to put one drop of oil right on that ledge. 
literally one drop of oil, okay? And we're gonna rotate the hand wheel and let that one drop distribute itself. Those are two pieces of metal that ride against each other when your machine is sewing. If you start to hear some clunking noises or it just starts to sound labored, this is probably the area you need to look at. So keep that one drop of oil in there, okay? Um, one drop. <laughs> and that's really all we have to do for maintenance in there. Now we're also going to take a look at the bobbin case, and this is very much like the front loading. Um, the difference with sometimes the Brother and the Juki machines do have... Um, this is called a backlash spring, that little black squiggly thing in there. If you have one of those, it should stay in there. They may wear out. Um, if you're having issues with cut threads and you can't figure it out, talk to your dealer or your service person about this because that spring may need to be replaced. But for the most part, you want to leave the spring in there and make sure there's no threads caught anywhere in there. And then on, this is your tension spring where you load your thread. You want to make sure there's no threads caught under that spring. Now don't pry, don't dig, don't bend anything up. You just want to make sure there's no threads caught in there. And if you need to, take a Q-tip and give it a clean, a good clean out, but you want to not disturb that spring that's in there. So once we're finished with that, give your plate a once over. Make sure there's a little dust on here. Um, use a, a soft towel or your pipe cleaner. Get all the dust off of there. And we're going to get this put back on our machine. So, got to figure out where this goes. And this is going to get my screws back in. As I did in a previous video, I like the, these need to be hand tight and not so tight that you can't get it off again the next time. So let's get the screw started in there. Now again, I like to use my fingernail to get it as tight as I can. I don't feel like I need a screwdriver to actually put this back on. I'm going to do the same for this screw. And then again, I'm going to use my fingernail and, and just keep it, get it as tight as I can with my fingernail. And then we're going to call that good. Okay. And then you can load your bobbin back up, put that back in your machine, put your needle and foot back on, and you are ready to roll. So the difference between some of these straight stitch machines and our regular home domestic is that you do have an external um, upper tension. This is when you're threading your thread through. This is your upper tension that creates drag on the thread to give you a good stitch. What I want you to do is check and make sure you don't see any lint in this area. There's not much you want to do. You don't want to take this off. If you see um, some lint, clean it out and then, um, you know, just make sure and that things are working well. You want to lift the presser foot. As you can see, this is me lifting the presser foot. It opens the discs and when I close it, it close, or drop it, it closes the disc back up. So make sure that that's moving as it should. You also want to check the upper, uh, the take-up lever here. Make sure there's no threads caught in here, nothing visible. And that's really it for maintaining this machine.